Hi, I'm Gary James, Senior Editor of Guns and Ammo Magazine, and this is the first in a series chronicling the history of firearms, and there's no better place to start than the beginning, and the beginning is the introduction of gunpowder into Europe. Now, uh, gunpowder probably came into Europe around the beginning or middle of the 13th century, most likely came from the Far East. In the East, it was really used more for pyrotechnics and explosions and that sort of thing, but they never really mastered the idea of actually firing a projectile with black powder. The first reference in Europe to actual firearms were really with cannons, and, and there's actually a picture and a description at the Battle of Crecy in about 1315 of a big, heavy, pot-shaped cannon. Not too long afterwards, they came out with smaller things called handguns or hand cannons. While they weren't particularly accurate, they did have a couple of advantages. First of all, the hand cannon's main competitor was the longbow or the crossbow. Now, uh, to learn to use a longbow, it took years and years and years of practice. A crossbow, it still took several, two or three or four months to learn how to use one properly. A hand cannon, you could train somebody totally unfamiliar with any kind of weaponry at all how to shoot one in, in an afternoon. It wasn't a problem. Plus, crossbows would take two or three weeks to make, another week to make the crannikin, which was necessary to draw the heavy pull on the crossbow. Some of them could be several hundred pounds. A hand cannon can be made in an afternoon, and they could cast uh, 20 or 30 bullets in, in the period of a few minutes. Consequently, it was a lot more practical. It was a little more difficult to load a crossbow. Hand cannons, basically, we were not quite sure exactly how they carried their powder. We'd, one would assume they had them in pouches. They would have a little touch that was probably made out of a, of, a, of a wick of some sort. My guess is they most likely used something similar to the rush lights that they used in their homes. People say that they used iron wire, but that doesn't make sense. Carrying a hot uh, wire uh, for any period of time, immediately the glow is going to go off, and secondly, it's going to be too darn hot to hold. So my guess is, again, they used some sort of rush light. But uh, we're going to shoot these today. Hand cannons were loaded pretty much like any muzzle loader uh, at the period or later. Uh, you poured powder down the barrel, followed by a ball. You could either ram it or not. Most likely, to give it a little bit of a tamp. Prime the touch hole. And then, and that's all there is to it. And when you hit your target with a hand cannon, especially a mounted knight, you could pierce armor. With a crossbow, you couldn't. In any event, this was the beginning. And once the first hand cannon was touched off, the face of warfare was changed forever. While hand cannons certainly changed the face of battle, the human spirit, being ever restless, recognized that this was not the, the end-all and be-all of firearms uh, for actual warfare. They realized that guns had to be made easier to use, and you had to be able to actually aim them and stand a chance of hitting something with them. Tucking a hand cannon under your arm and hoping the ball is going to hit somewhere in the area of your target it just wasn't good enough. Well, about the middle of the 16th century, they came up with very, very simple serpentines that were attached to the side of the early hand cannons, into which you could cut a match cord. Now, a match cord was like a piece of hemp or cotton that would be soaked in a mixture of potassium nitrate or vinegar to keep it burning and smoldering. And you could manipulate it, load the gun, carry the match cord in your hand, cock it in the gun, actually raise the gun, and, and fire it, and get a semblance of accuracy out of it. By the 17th century, they got even more sophisticated. They uh, had actual spring-loaded uh, mechanisms, such as this one, and they had uh, really refined the loading techniques. They used, uh, by the 1620s, 1630s, these bandoliers, and each one of these little charges, there were 12 of them, they, they, they nicknamed them the 12 apostles, actually. Uh, each one of these would have a little uh, charge of powder in it. You'd uh, load it, you would uh, clip your match cord into the cock, now the match cord would be burning, and you'd have both ends of the match cord burning because, uh, A, in case one went out, you didn't want to be stuck with uh, a loaded gun and no way to set it off, or B, if perhaps you grabbed the wrong one, you wanted to make sure at least whatever you grabbed was going to be burning and firing. Loading a matchlock musket's really not all that difficult. Take and pour your powder down the barrel, from one of the little cartridges on your 12 apostles, drop the ball down the barrel, ram it with a scouring stick. They didn't call it a ramrod, they called it a scouring stick. Returned. <clears throat> Primed. <laughs> Blew off the powder. Put the match cord in the cock. <laughs> Blow off the cord, test it. Uncover the pan and give fire. <laughs> 
you could really fire these things about two or three times a minute if you really, uh, if you really did uh, practice with them. And for the first time, the foot soldier achieved parity with a mounted troop. It really democratized the battlefield. While matchlocks revolutionized the battlefield, they had one major problem. You couldn't carry them loaded and ready to fire. You had to manipulate them with two hands, and it took a while to get them into action. So obviously what was needed was some sort of mechanism where all a guy had to do was pick up a gun, pull the trigger, and have it go off. And that mechanism was the wheel lock. It appeared about 1515. It was very, very ingenious. Complicated, clever, but very, very fast, and it was working properly, an extremely reliable system. As its name implies, it employed a spinning wheel. The wheel was serrated. You loaded the gun through the muzzle like you did in a normal uh, firearm. You would prime the pan, pull the dog's head down. Now, the dog's head had a piece of iron pyrite in it, not flint, because if you put flint in there, as you'll find out later on when we talk about the flint lock, uh, the flint would grind down the wheel, where the pyrite actually made sparks itself. Okay, first you just basically loaded a wheel lock through the muzzle like you did other guns of the period. Round ball. Ram the ball in place. Then you took a special spanner, turn it about a quarter of a turn, primed, closed the pan cover, brought the dog's head down, and gave fire. Prior to this, it just wouldn't be practical to have a one hand held gun where you had to hook another match cord into it. Didn't make sense. But the wheel lock actually made the handgun possible. Uh, it also was very popular in sporting weapons and in some high end military arms. The big problem with it was it was complicated. You had to have about 18 or 19 particular moving parts all working at the same time for it to work properly. But the one thing the wheel lock did do, it made the handgun possible. It was very, very popular and was even used well into the flintlock era. Lots and lots of people preferred the wheel lock because it was faster. And when it was working, it was a real marvel. People have been using flint and steel to start fires for centuries, almost back to Roman times. So it wasn't such a far stretch to figure some way to make some sort of a, a weapon firing mechanism out of a flint and steel setup. Now what I have here is uh, what's called a French lock, which is kind of the, the high point of the flint lock system. It was the most reliable and it was uh, extremely easy to use and keep in repair. And what the French lock did and what later flint locks did, they had a combination L-shaped uh, frizzen or steel that not only allowed um, the flint to strike against it, but it also covered the pan. By the time of the Napoleonic Wars, and even well into the 1820s and 30s, it had become the preeminent style of ignition system on the battlefield. Very, very reliable. These guns were used well into the, almost in the 20th century, by some of the, some of the mountaineers shooting their Kentucky rifles. Uh, it was very easy to, um, to obtain flints. The mechanisms were easy to repair. Indians liked these particularly because with later percussion and cartridge guns, they couldn't always get caps, they couldn't get cartridges, but they could always find a piece of flint or something somewhere. So Indians used uh, flint locks much, much later than, than the Europeans or the Americans did. Uh, most military type uh, smoothbore muskets of the Napoleonic period and, and earlier and even later uh, were fired with using paper cartridges. Uh, what you had was a cartridge that included the ball and the powder. And the way you fired the gun was you would uh, bite off the cartridge, Put her on half cock, do a little powder for priming. Pour the rest of the powder down the barrel along with the ball. Rammed it home. Cocked the piece, presented it, and fired. Very, very reliable, sturdy, and robust. You can't ask for much better than that. Since the early 16th century, people had known that uh, fulminates of silver and fulminates of mercury, you know, when, when put on a hard surface and struck with a hammer, it would explode. The problem with them were they were very, very powerful, so they couldn't figure any way to adapt them to firearm use. They were just too dangerous. That is until 1808, when a Scottish clergyman named Forsyth devised a mechanism whereby you could actually ignite the charge of the gun using fulminate. He devised kind of a funny little rotating bottle that fit on the side of the lock. You turn it over uh, every time you want a little charge of fulminate and cock the hammer and pull the trigger and it fired. 
The problem with it was it would sometimes blow the little bottle right off the lock because Fulminate was very, very powerful. So what was needed was a better system. But the one that became the most popular actually used a copper percussion cap. And what this did, it had a little bit of Fulminate in it. You would put it on a nipple, load your gun in the normal manner, cock the gun, pull the trigger, uh, the hammer would strike the uh, Fulminate, it would explode, send a spark into the charge and set it off. Okay, what we're shooting here is a, a British 1842 musket. It was an early percussion military arm. Uh, up to a point it loaded very much in the same manner as the flintlocks. In other words, you used a paper cartridge, you, know, you tore the base of it off, but in this case you didn't have to prime first. You still put your powder down, you put your ball down, ram it home, but now rather than fooling around with the flash and the pan and all that sort of thing and the unreliability of a flint lock, you put a simple percussion cap on, cock the gun, aimed and fired. Neat, slick, reliable, it's cool. The development of the percussion system freed us from the cumbersome ignition setups of the past and with its inception there was really no stopping the more modern development of the firearm. Some of the earliest military muskets fired from what was called a cartridge. This is a cartridge. It has the ball and the powder in it. The only thing is it's not self-contained. It took some sort of an external priming mechanism to actually fire the gun, to set the charge off. One of the earliest was used by Prussia, actually, in what was called a Dreise needle gun. This looks like a regular paper cartridge, although it has one difference between the cartridge that I just showed you. It actually has a priming mechanism in it. All you had to do was load this into the gun. It was an early bolt action breech loader. Close the bolt and pull the trigger and fire it. Not a problem, it was slick, easy to use, incredibly reliable. The Prussians used this gun from the early 1840s right up to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. The next step was called a pin fire. It was a metallic cartridge. It contained powder, ball, and a percussion cap, and a little pin. And what happened, you would load this into the gun. Originally they were shotguns and then they were uh, devolved into revolvers. Uh, the hammer would strike the little pin, the little pin would strike the percussion cap, set the load off. Pin fires came in about the mid-1840s and were used in Europe well into the 20th century. Very, very popular in a lot of different calibers and extremely popular in shotguns as well as handguns. Our next step was called rim fire, and you're familiar with those today. They're still being made in the little 22s. Uh, and what it, what it involved was your priming compound was in the rim of the actual metallic cartridge. You had your powder and your ball. The hammer would strike the rim, the rim would set off the fulminate, the fulminate would set off the charge and explode the cartridge and send the ball flying down the barrel. The problem with it was it wasn't real practical for high pressure loads. So what came next is the one that probably we're all most familiar with, the center fire. The center fire involved a percussion cap actually in the center of the base, hence center fire. Depending on what type it was, whether it was bedan or boxer, it could be reloaded if you wanted to. Uh, and it was more suitable to high pressure loads as we're aware of today. This is a Snyder breech loader. Uh, it it uh, entered British service in 1866. It fires a big 577 round. Uh, again, it's center fire. It's very easy to load. Stick the cartridge in, close the breech block, cock the gun, and fire. The center fire is the actual apex of the curve. Uh, perhaps later on we'll come up with some caseless rounds, things like this that actually work, but right now center fire is it. What is rifling and how does it work? Well, rifling are grooves in the barrel of a rifle that impart a spin to the bullet. When the bullet spins, it evens out the imperfections in the bullet, gives it kind of a gyroscopic action, and allows it to fire more accurately at greater distances. Now, people knew about rifling back in the 16th century. It probably developed from them cutting grooves in the barrels of a gun to take up the black powder fouling. They found that if they cut spiral grooves, you'd have more surface to take up more fouling, and the bullets that were fired out of guns that had that spiral grooving were more accurate than smooth bores. Consequently, they figured that uh, there might be something going on here, and they developed rifles. Now, the early rifles generally uh, were loaded with a patched ball. In other words, you had to have the ball be able to grip the rifling. So you'd either use a patch, or sometimes they would even hammer the lead ball down the barrel to grip the rifling. This was slow and laborious. Uh, there's no problem uh, with firing a smoothbore because you can load them fast. The balls are subcalibre, they bounce out the barrel, and it's not a big deal. 
rifle not the same thing. Now this is a very early example of a rifle. This is a German Jaeger rifle from about 1690. It was a very popular form of sporting gun. They also use these guns in the military. In fact, some of them were brought over during the American Revolution and used by German troops. And it's what the Kentucky rifle evolved from eventually. So they needed something simpler. What they came up with were mechanically fitting bullets such as the Brunswick, the Whitworth, uh, the Jacobs in which the bullet uh, might have a belt on it or it might be uh, shaped to actually fit uh, the rifling itself. The rifling would be a hexagonal, the bullet would be hexagonal, and it would be a little easier to load and give you greater accuracy. Then in the early 1850s, uh, a Frenchman named Claude Etienne Minier came up with a terrific solution for the military rifle. He invented a bullet that had a hollow base, and it was subcaliber. You loaded it down the bore like a muzzle loader. When you pulled the trigger, the gases expanded the base and it would grip the rifling and spin the bullet. Revolutionary, practically every major country in the world adopted it. It was the major gun used during the American Civil War. This is an example of one of the most important military firearms in history, a mini rifle. In this particular case, it's a US 1861 Springfield, the principal uh, firearm of the North during the American Civil War. The way a mini rifle worked, it's very interesting. It has a special bullet, conical bullet, with a hollow base. The bullet is much smaller than the bore. So you'd pour your powder down the barrel, put the bullet in, ram it down, load it, and when the gun was fired, the gases would expand that base and they would fit into the rifling. It gave incredible accuracy and turned every man in the field into a rifleman. When practical breech loaders eventually evolved, the problem was pretty much solved. That way you could load a bullet from the breech that was larger than the rifling, close the breech, fire it, and you'd have no problem. And pretty much that's the system we use today. Once practical breech loaders came on the scene, the rifling problem was pretty much solved because you could uh, load a bullet that was larger than the, uh, the size of the bore into the breech, fire it, and it would grip the rifling with no problem. This Model 1871 Remington rolling block fires a 50-70 cartridge, which means it had a 50 caliber bullet and 70 grains of black powder behind it. This was the U.S. military round until the 4570 was developed. Breech loading arms, in other words, firearms that load from the rear of the gun rather than from the front, go back almost to the inception of firearms themselves. Breech loading cannons date back to the 14th century and there were lots of early, early breech loaders. The problem with a breech loader is, especially in the early days, is how do you seal the breech effectively? In other words, you don't want gases escaping. Uh, you need to uh, be able to load them rapidly, quickly, and safely. Uh, fouling should not block the system. And so consequently, it was, it was slow getting going. One of the earlier ones was the Ferguson, designed by British Major Patrick Ferguson. Uh, military versions of this rifle, this is a sporter by the way, were used during the American Revolution. They had a small core of Ferguson riflemen and they were quite effective. It has an interesting mechanism in that the trigger guard turns, you'd pour the ball in the barrel, pour powder behind it, close the breech, scoop the remaining powder into the pan, cock it, and fire it. Very, very reliable and it was good for 10 or 15 shots before it became too foul to use. Pretty soon they came up with better systems. Uh, most of them used paper cartridges, such as the Hall. This is a U.S. Model 1836 Hall carbine. Very, very practical gun, one of the best uh, and most reliable of the early breech loaders. It's very simple. It has a rising block. You take a paper cartridge. In this case, we have a buck and ball load. We have a bullet in there with three pieces of buckshot. Very common load for the period. Tear off the back of the case. Put the powder and the bullet in. Poke it down with your finger. Close the breech, cap the gun, then they kind of evolved over to metallic cartridges. But the first metallic cartridges, such as the uh, Maynard or the Burnside, used a separately primed case. In other words, you had to put a percussion cap on there after you loaded the gun. Then you'd take the case out and load another one. This is a, a Maynard breech loader, a Civil War vintage cavalry carbine. Very, very popular little gun. It was one of that class of guns that actually fired a metallic cartridge, but it did not have a primer in it. It had to use a percussion cap to set the round off. There were a number of guns like this during the Civil War. There were Smiths, there were Gallagher's, there were Burnside's. The Maynard was one of the most popular. It was such an adaptable little firearm that uh, after the adoption of uh, self-contained cartridges, this gun was made in actual breech-loading self-contained uh, fashion and used as a popular sporting and hunting rifle for a long time. Take the cartridge, it's 52 caliber, just load it in the breech, very simple. Cock the hammer, put a nipple, cap on the nipple, and... Repeating rifles, in other words, rifles that could be fired more than one time on a single loading, 
actually go back a lot farther than most people think. One of the earliest systems, the Lorenzoni, uh, came out in about the middle of the 17th century. It, it, it featured a, a powder chamber in the butt, a ball chamber in the front, and a little uh, chamber for priming, and all one had to do was manipulate a lever, and you could get a number of shots out of this gun. It was fairly popular well up into the 18th century. As well, there were other types like the Kaltoff that were actually issued to, this, to the, the Swedish military during the Thirty Years' War, and, and, and a number of others. However, it really took the self-contained cartridge to make the breech loader a practical gun. Now, one of the earliest was the one I'm carrying here is the Spencer. Uh, this, along with its, uh, its mate, the Henry rifle, which was the precursor to the Winchester, came out around the time of the Civil War. The Spencer's a really a cool gun. It employed a rotating breech block, had an external hammer, and cartridges were loaded into the butt through a uh, magazine in the rear. Drop the rounds in, the follower back in, work the lever, cock the hammer, Along with the Spencer, the Henry was one of the most influential repeaters of the early period. This gun fired 16 44 caliber rimfire loads. It was an amazing gun. You can see it was kind of the, the precursor of the 1866 Winchester and other Winchesters to, uh, to come. Uh, you loaded it through the magazine at the base. One of the problems was, unfortunately, the magazine was exposed, so the ammunition, you could get dirt in there, the magazine could get dented a little easily, and uh, they could occasionally have feeding problems, although, generally speaking, they were very, very reliable. The Spencer had the advantage of having a more powerful cartridge. The Henry only used a, a light, kind of a lightweight 44 rimfire, where this used a 56 caliber rimfire. These guns were very, very popular, very reliable. Uh, you could fire seven shots out of this gun and 16 shots out of, the, uh, out of the Henry. Like everything else, systems became improved in different types of magazines, and the adoption of the bolt action uh, made the repeater even more practical. Uh, early ones had tubular magazines, such as the 7184 German Mauser, and later we had box magazines that came in with uh, some of the other later Mausers and uh, US type guns. There were a few aberrations, such as the uh, 3040 Craig, which had kind of a funny box loading on the side. With stripper clip loading and the box magazine, the bolt action repeater really came of age. This is a 03 Springfield, one of the finest military bolt action rifles ever made. Basically, it's a modification of the Mauser, and it's a superb gun. Shoots well, accurate, reliable, rugged, and just spectacularly well made. Revolving handguns go back quite a ways. Um, there were revolving wheel locks, there were revolving flint locks, uh, there were ones that had cylinders similar to the later guns, there were ones that had rotating barrels like the pepper box, uh, but it really took the percussion system to make the revolver a viable setup. And the guy that did it was Samuel Colt. Now again, they were revolvers a little prior to him, but they weren't the same. They were the pepper boxes with the totally revolving barrels. They were heavy, they were ungainly, you couldn't sight across a moving barrel. Uh, they had a tendency to all go off at once, uh, so they weren't real practical, although they were cheap, and they were used alongside the later Colt single actions uh, you know, for a good number of years. In any event, in 1836, Samuel Colt came out with his first Patterson revolver. It was called a Patterson because it was made in Patterson, New Jersey. It was percussion. You loaded it with loose powder and ball, put percussion caps on the back, and away you went. It was the first of a long line of percussion guns, and then later they developed into uh, cartridge revolvers. But in the meantime, Colts were single action, which meant you had to cock the gun every time you fired it. In 1851, an Englishman called Robert Adams came out with a very, very practical double action revolver. There was a big controversy over which was better, double action or single action. In, case, in many cases, it's kind of still going on today. There are single action aficionados and double action aficionados. But the 1851 Adams really started the double action movement. This is the model 1851 Dean Adams and Dean. It was a very, very nice gun. It had a very smooth double action. Uh, it was reliable and rugged. The early models, such as this one, uh, did not have a spur on the hammer. They could only be fired double action. And this was considered a bit of a criticism, especially when arguing against the single action Colts. So Adams uh, came up with a single action and double action version later on. It was a very reliable gun. It was used uh, during the Crimean War, uh, during the uh, Britain's India Mutiny in the 1857s, and a number of them were seen in the American Civil War. One of the major milestones in the development of the revolver, of course, was the use of the self-contained metallic cartridge. Uh, the British were very early to adopt a, a centerfire round uh, in their Adams revolver. It's a 450 load. Uh, 
like many guns of the period, you loaded it through the gate. Six rounds of 450 atoms, rather weak load, but it worked. Closed it. The nice thing about the atoms was you could fire it both single action or double action. Part of the problem with the early cartridge revolvers were you loaded them singly and you punched the cartridges out singly. But that all changed both in Europe and in America with simultaneous ejection systems. One of the best was designed by Smith & Wesson in their number three revolver. This particular gun was easy to load. All you do is break it open, charge it. This particular one's in 44 Russian. It was made for Argentina. Close the gun, cock it and fire. But the real magic came when you had to empty the cases. It saved you a lot of time, especially in the heat of battle or when there's engines after you. All you did was open it up, flip out the cases, and away you go. Kind of the final development in the revolver was the uh, invention of the swing-out cylinder. This particular one is a Model 1892 Colt. It was a very early swing-out cylinder gun. It's called a swing-out cylinder for very obvious reasons. You pull the lever back, you swing the cylinder out. It was very easy to load rapidly. You'd fire it. When you'd expanded the cases, all you had to do was push back on a rod, kick the cases out, and away you go. Very, very fast, very, very reliable. Today, this is the most common type of double-action revolver. With the invention of the self-contained cartridge, and finally with smokeless powder, it was possible to actually have a semi-automatic or automatic firearm. That is, a gun that the uh, recoil or the uh, gases would help not only fire the gun, drive the bullet out of the barrel, but would actually operate the action. The earliest practical one was invented by Hugo Borchardt about 1890. It was workable, but it was cumbersome. It took Georg Luger to modify the toggle bolt setup on the Borchardt into a more practical gun. It's one that we've come to know as the Luger, although at the time it was called the Parabellum. This is one of the most recognizable handguns in the world, the Luger. You can take a person that doesn't know anything about firearms, show them this, and they'll say, oh, that's a Luger. It has a distinctive silhouette. It's been seen in movies all over the world. It was a popular war trophy in World War I and World War II, and it's a pretty good gun. It was first adopted by the Swiss in 1900. Uh, the Germans' uh, Navy adopted it later on, and then the German Army in 1908, hence its designation P08 as well. It fired a 9mm Parabellum round from a box magazine. Had kind of a toggle action that was taken off from the Borchardt. And works darn well. At the same time, Mauser was working on a gun. This is the 1896 Mauser broom handle, it's called, because the grip looks a little bit like a broom handle. It was 10 shot, 30 caliber. It fired with a stripper clip, and it had an integral box magazine. Unlike later guns, like the Luger or some of the Brownings that had removable box magazines, this one was integral. This is a very, very popular and influential gun, just as the Luger was. These were popular all over the world, and uh, especially in the Orient, where uh, the Chinese made copies of these. Very, very popular. They also had full auto versions of them, and you could attack shoulder stocks to them, like you could to the Luger, to get a little bit of extra accuracy out of them. In 1935, FN in Belgium came out with one of the finest auto pistols ever designed. It's still a very, very popular gun, and there are some people that swear by it, still holding it's the best auto pistol ever. Uh, John Browning considered it uh, kind of the, 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 uh, the final perfection of his 1911 government model design. However, it had one advantage as well. It had 13 rounds. It was a large capacity, 9mm, was used by a number of different countries and still is. The P38 is a wonderful auto pistol. Designed in the 1930s, uh, it was a double action auto, which meant that you could carry the gun with a round in the chamber, the hammer down, and all you had to do to fire the first round was pull the trigger. After that, it would fire in the full semi-auto functional mode. Very, very good gun, still being used today by many police forces and some military. The double action of the P38, coupled with the large capacity of the, of the Browning High Power, has led to kind of many of today's large capacity double action Wonder 9 auto pistols. Um, one would think you can't go any further, but it appears as though many manufacturers are. There are a lot of wonderful new developments coming out in the auto pistol field, but that, as they say, is a story for another time.